Good morning and welcome back uh, to the lecture series on partition of India in print media and uh, cinema. So, uh, we are going to continue our discussion on history and alternative memory writings and uh, we are talking about the subalterns and uh, their roles, how uh, the uh, major political parties in post colonial India have tried to exploit the Dalits for their own interests. The Dalit leaders generally refuse to follow or be included uh, in these major groups uh, and so uh, there are many instances uh, or in the pre-partition and post-partition history of the Dalits being attacked and subjected to brutalities. So, Dalits were seen as empty in their own identity and so they were seen best uh, suited for proselytization being converted to another religion and they would that way they would enhance the numerical strength of any religious community. So, this trend continued during the partition. In West Punjab for example, the Dalits were forced to accept Islam. Uh, Ravinder Kaur uh, notes how the untouchables uh, that had uh, hitherto remained uh, socially marginalized were being nationalized. Uh, a, through this process of uh, proselytization and uh, both in Bengal and in Punjab one sees that uh, Shuddhikaran among the Hindus was rampant. It was a process of uh, giving upper caste uh, status to the Dalits. Gyan Pandey therefore wants to understand the violence of partition through the eyes of the victims the, uh, and, and, uh, and through reading the positions of the aggressors as well as the onlookers through in, in other words through the uh, agencies of those that lived through partition. That is where we can actually inscribe the question of struggle and the more nuanced meanings of, of uh, the past. So, a series of studies uh, focusing mainly on the refugees uh, in Punjab and Bengal uh, explore the struggle uh, of the Dalits for citizenship and the process of rehabilitation. And so, Urvashi Butalia would go on to say that in its most exclusive focus on Hindus and Sikhs and Muslims, partition history has worked to render many others as invisible. One such history is that of the scheduled castes or the untouchables. So, so including the Dalits actually renders uh, more complicated uh, meanings to the history of partition. In the case of Bengal, uh, Shekhar Bandhupadhyay has made some prominent and very important contributions uh, uh, through his. Uh, studying the caste politics uh, in the partition of Bengal, how the, uh, the caste dimension played a vital role in uh, cracking up of the Bengal. So, uh, the multiple layers within the agricultural peasant communities in East Bengal according to Bandhupadhyay uh, precludes any kind of blanket categorization of Dalitness. Because, uh, when we understand Dalit as a homogeneous uh, caste, we also have to look at the uh, classified uh, or, or the differential experiences uh, in terms of one's class. So, on the one hand, there were the cases of poverty stricken Dalits that were more concerned with economic upliftment and abolition of social hierarchies. So, there were two types of cases on the one hand the poverty stricken Dalits uh, were concerned with uh, economic upliftment and abolition of social hierarchies and on the other there were the ones that had already availed upward mobility and they had started uh, you know uh, presenting regressive views. They were doubling the upper castes and willing to be institutionally accepted within the fold of the traditional upper caste Hindus. They were emulating uh, 
the upper caste behavior. So, while the most of the Dalits faced uh, subordination by the Hindu refined class people and the elite Muslims, the interest groups were actually bargaining with the mainstream political leaders. So, uh, we have earlier already discussed about the case of Panchanan Burman, who went on to become a barrister from among the Dalits. He was in a position to neg negotiate the uh, issues of the Dalits with the upper caste political leaders. So, the Hindu Muslim atrocity uh, no longer remained a high caste political affair. The scheduled castes were uh, supporting the mainstream Hindu sentiments. So, uh, there were certain views that were also being forwarded by the Dalit groups. Uh, while the leaders from among the Dalits uh, would be against uh, partition, he, uh, I have Jogindranath Mundal's uh, name in mind. He was uh, 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 an important leader from among the scheduled castes uh, and he actually uh, opposed partition. However, we see that the majority of the Dalits are influenced either by Congress or by Hindu Mahasabha politicians and they propose integrationist positions and they want to see themselves chiefly as part of the Hindu majority nation state. So, they are I mean they are misplaced uh, or, or they are uh, uh, you know misinformed uh, uh, support is uh, exploited by the mainstream leaders. So, partition on the other hand does not result in inclusion of the Dalit provinces within India. This is in the case of Bengal. Population vote for partition. Uh, most of their provinces actually go on to become part of East Pakistan, which is now Bangladesh. All the Dalit provinces such as uh, Bakarganj, Faridpur, Jashore, Khulna and uh, Rajbansi areas such as Rangpur, Dinajpur, they all go into uh, East Pakistan. They were mainly agriculturalists, they were landless peasants, they were not prepared with the socio-economic capital to resettle in the new land. So, this political decision of partition which they support, which, which actually gains their ignorant support results in undoing their social and political mobility and even their caste based unity. So, the Dalits are actually dispersed all over India. Their choice of uh, living together is uh, not promoted by, uh, the, the, uh, by the host country. So, they have to uh, migrate in destitute conditions and start from the scratch and they have to actually etch out a living through uh, you know struggling and fighting with the local uh, local Dalit and grassroots populace. So, a decision uh, that was uh, uh, I mean that was enacted by the elites actually uh, affected the Dalit uh, uh, migrants in the worst way. They were worst hit by the partition, but these are the chapters of history that remain untold. So, in the mid 1940s, uh, we see that uh, Dalits are used as scapegoats in the Hindu Muslim strife. The Dalits uh, from Namashudra and Rajbansi Santal groups are uh, included within the Hindu fold uh, through uh, indoctrinations and they are deployed in the vanguards of uh, Hindu militancy. And it, it is a strategy used uh, by the Bengal Congress to win most of the scheduled caste seats in the assembly election uh, of uh, 1946. Jitu Santal's death in police encounter uh, happens when he enacts a debased form of uh, Kali worship. Uh, 
uh, in Adina mosque. So, the Hindus provoke uh, a Santal to worship Kali in uh, a mosque and it results in his death uh, through police encounter. So, this is one of the numerous incidents uh, of aggression between the Santals and the Muslims, the Dalits and the Muslims. So, Dalits are used uh, in the vanguard of the uh, uh, Hindu militant groups against the Muslims. So, uh, how Dalit autonomous politics was uh, appropriated uh, to, to broaden the base of uh, the Hindus in an emergent Indian uh, national politics is an aspect that has been conspicuously underplayed in the official narratives of the subcontinent's partition. Partha Chatterjee as well as uh, uh, other uh, historians like Joya Chatterjee and uh, Shekhar Bandhupadhyay, Ranabir Shamadar, all these uh, historians look at the roles of the Dalits and how they were exploited. The extent to which such understandings are uh, you know obfuscated or eclipsed by mainstream narratives is underscored by the distinction made by Pandey, by Gyan Pandey between uh, national progressive history and the local inconsequential histories uh, that can neither be narrativized nor be uh, nor, nor given to any straight jacketed uh, theorization. So, the concern with negotiating a relationship with the na nation by reconstructing a new memory of the past informs the proliferation of uh, Dalit newspapers and journals in northern India. So, uh, through interrogating received histories, the Dalit sphere actually uh, started uh, the process of Dalit awakening. So, through newspapers and journals, uh, one sees how the process of Dalit awakening uh, happens. And we have already spoken about the feminist oral history and its emergence. Uh, it talks about the neglect of women's voice in traditional sources. And uh, so, oral history becomes an opportunity uh, to integrate the women as uh, the women as uh, subjects in uh, into historical uh, scholarship. Uh, Sheila Rowe Bottom notes that women's experiences in historical discourse were often hidden and new methodologies, women's personal testimonies that allowed uh, challenging that, that enabled challenging historical interpretations based upon the lives and documentations of uh, and by men. So, the parameters, the values, the perspectives were entirely different uh, in uh, subaltern's uh, recording of the past, be it the woman, be it the Dalit. As a methodological tool, oral history complemented rather than competed with official documentary sources. Uh, so, the oral histories uh, provided a more comprehensive analysis. They moved away from mere statistics of uh, uh, about women's lives and their conditions and they enable us to uh, understand the consequences, the aftermath and not just the event itself. Uh, using of oral testimonies uh, allow or enable one to understand the lived experiences of the ordinary lives. Uh, so, oral histories uh, empower the unexpressed utterances which would otherwise remain undocumented. This process the legitimizing the oral histories uh, is a way of democratizing the discourses that had uh, till a long time remained uh, within the stronghold of uh, male centric high politics. So, uh, it is also a question of ethical dilemma uh, for the scholars that approach that try to work on uh, oral histories. Uh, 
The question of ethical dilemma uh, is uh, more uh, present when, when dealing with stories of trauma, forced migration, uh, rape and loss of one's uh, homeland. So, these are emotive uh, subjects that evoke strong responses uh, and so it is hard to relive the painful experience through the process of recounting the past. So, Bona et al. Uh, says I quote for the oral historians the interview is always more than the recorded and transcribed words. It is a process in which the narrator, uh, the interviewee is actively constructing and creating an account and it is also a question of uh, subsuming the, the position, the agency of the narrator by the academic, by the uh, scholar and her scholarship. So, uh, there is a uh, a power imbalance between the two agents. So, ultimately the interviewer is in a uh, position of greater power a, through her uh, role of interpreting, recounting, analyzing the interview and the interviewee who has actually experienced and uh, who is the center of this entire discourse has no power or control. Uh, through the entire process or uh, has no control over the outcome in the scholarship itself. So, there is a dilemma about uh, the use of these uh, accounts and the radical potential of oral history in reclaiming the uh, past of the ordinary people. Priya Kumar says that uh, it may be apt to describe the past in presentness of partition as a history that is not done with or refuses to be past unquote. So, I mean in, in the Indian subcontinent the process of uh, territorial consciousness as Ranabir Samadhar uh, suggests the moment of partition actually marked the beginning of a territorial consciousness. So, understanding of borders was a result of a geopolitical imagination which uh, actually defines the partition. Gil Martin would uh, further note that for both India and Pakistan uh, rather than the independence from uh, Great Britain. So, for both India and Pakistan partition was uh, a process of uh, fixing territorial definitions of the nation state uh, much more than it was uh, independence from Great Britain. The divide along communal lines is something that all these uh, uh, subaltern historians go on to question. So, at different junctures in history there were different micro societies in India that had witnessed uh, different forms of groupism and these groups were constantly in a state of flux. They would never be permanent fixed groups. The sharecroppers against uh, both the Hindu zamindars and the Muslim landlords and elites. There were the Dalit Hindus against the Hindu elites. Uh, the milkman community would be against both the Hindus and the Muslims and yet out of uh, I mean all these sorts of uh, complexities and heterogeneities, uh, I mean living together, living a, a life of a harmony and living with certain degree of dignity and respect was uh, never thought as impossible. The coexistence of communities were never seen an exceptionally undefeatable problem. So, when we look at partition in literature and media. Uh, we uh, look at uh, Derrida's uh, definition of literature serving as a real testimony and a fiction of testimony more than a testimony in which the witness swears to tell the truth. Fiction opens the possibility for truthful testimony, uh, something that announces its inability to tell the truth and so it tells the story of its own failure. So, the testimony may assume the autobiographical voice that 
uh, writes about the singular experience. However, fiction's creative power, so the creative license used by friction uh, creates an illusion of an eye or maybe the failed eye, the eye that cannot be that is able to bear and conceive the unimaginable, the unbearable and the unnameable in a comprehensive way. So, uh, that is the capacity of fiction which even testimony uh, cannot uh, boast. So, what are the genres that can contain the, the, the vast experience? The, the, the ramified uh, meanings of partition. So, Anna Bernard would say that buildings Roman and uh, fragmented narrative are majorly the two forms that uh, replicate the processes through which the event of partition is memorialized. Right. So, uh, memorialization is not only through recording the evidences of physical and psychic violence inflicted by the partition, but also creating counterfactual representations uh, of pre-partition history and the post-partition present. So, creating counterfactual representations of pre-partition history and the post-partition present. So, uh, counterfactualism is actually a process of challenging the inevitability or necessity of partition. What if partition did not happen? It encourages the reader to consider other forms of uh, socio-political organizations or a different possible future. It tries to conceive an alternative future. I mean something that could have come into being or can still come into being. So, that is uh, actually uh, a kind of reversal or making the facts of partition stand on their head. So, partition literature does not uh, necessarily destabilize, uh, interrupt or expose the national narratives, but they can be counterfactualists. They can create parallel facts. And that is uh, where the license of creativity lies, that is where fiction plays a momentous role. It becomes uh, larger in effect than uh, testimony. So, the value of uh, imagination becomes more important than the value of witnessing. Partition literature's capacity to gesture towards and in some cases formally construct a uh, vision of collectivity and nationhood based on solidarity, not separation. So, uh, reconstruing uh, new meanings out of the facts uh, given in hand that is counterfactualism. So, understanding in terms of unity in terms of uh, harmony rather than uh, separation and uh, uh, competition. So, uh, shadow lines by Amitav Ghosh uh, uh, remembers it, it, it uh, talks about the gaps and silences uh, underlying the formation of nation states and how such silences when articulated put these uh, unified, these imaginary communities into a desire. National memory is constantly evading these newly formed nations. So, uh, shadow lines commemorates stories of ordinary Hindus and Muslims that were uh, risking their own lives to save members from the other communities. These stories of harmony, of friendship and uh, humanity, uh, you know, uh, humanity outliving any kinds of uh, animosity, any, any form of uh, rivalry are uh, not uh, 
celebrated in the mainstream discourse. The mainstream discourse always comes across in the form of a dyad in and so nations are constituted as uh, you know binary meanings as, as dyads or oppositional uh, entities. So, in shadow lines the figure of the grandmother uh, who is brought up with the dream of nationalism and a, a, a figure that has internalized the language of modernity uh, understands that the state is the only legitimate purveyor of violence. So, the grandmother's dilemma lies in the fact that she is a Hindu from East Bengal. So, her, her geographies of nationhood is called to question as she is on the one hand a Hindu woman uh, from East Bengal and yet her nationality uh, actually is tied up with India and her. So, her current uh, you know existence uh, overlaps uh, with, uh, with a geopolitical space that is outside of East Bengal. So, her home and her nationality are not the same they are at odds with each other. So, uh, there, the common genres of partition literature could be romance, Bildungsroman and fragmented narratives. Uh, when we talk of romance we are thinking of uh, many uh, artworks that celebrate lovers on opposite sides of the partition. Here I am thinking of uh, Garam Hawa by M. S. Satyu, uh, an important film on partition which shows uh, how, uh, how the lovers cannot meet. So, so the frustrated uh, love stories uh, in the face of uh, larger communal disturbances. So, love stories that are tragically thwarted and uh, they are not realized most of the times in exile narrative. So, love stories uh, that are generally not uh, realized and there is an irreversibility of the pre-partition innocence. The innocence uh, uh, that was enjoyed before the partition can never, the prelapsarian innocence cannot, uh, cannot be uh, regained. So, uh, desired union among the lovers uh, intensify rather than undermine the divide. And then the genre of Bildung's Roman that aligns the narrator's coming of age with the event of the partition itself. So, Midnight's Children is uh, one of such narratives of coming of age uh, through awareness of the legacy of partition. We are also reminded of Lenny's character in Cracking India, Babsi Sidwa's Cracking India, where uh, the child's innocence is taken away uh, by the awareness of uh, communal divides, communal rivalries. And so, it is also coming of age uh, story where the child steps into adulthood, she learns about many adult emotions and uh, is cognizant of uh, these uh, you know complicated human relations uh, as she witnesses the process of immigration. She witnesses uh, the neighbors uh, emigrating uh, to India. Uh, and so, pre-partition period implies childish uh, innocence where post-partition whereas, post-partition implies disillusionment. So, the, the pristine innocence before partition it is irrevocably lost and so, the dystopia of the present seems uh, almost insurmountable. Nostalgia is constitutively anti-partitionist. Nostalgia is is always facing and directed homeward and the home, the concept of home actually transcends any kind of false boundaries. So, it holds on to the possibility of a different kind of in other words a more unified future for the subcontinent. So, Bildungsroman forms features of semi autobiographical protagonist who is simultaneously uh, anticipating and yet also averting the inevitability of partition. So, partition buildings Roman uh, depends on partitions historical trajectory uh, in as a way of uh, you know uh, attaining as a way of uh, obtaining some momentum for the plot and yet uh, 
also challenges the belief of permanent communal divide. So, it is following the historical trajectory for the momentum of the plot and yet opposing uh, the, the precipitating of the partition. It insists on the agency of the individuals to assert the existence of a difficult past and promote a more inclusive form of nationality. And finally, fragmented narrative uh, in fragmentation we see uh, representation of the protagonists ina inability to uh, understand uh, the total meaning, the entire meaning of the post partition order. The, there is a kind of gap uh, in, in uh, comprehending the uh, significance of uh, this divide. There is a counterfactual potential in reconnecting the fragments and thereby uh, you know which symbolizes uh, the desire for reunification. Uh, piecing the fragments together would symbolize uh, the desire for reunification or arriving at an imaginative deconstruction and reassembly. Uh, which, uh, which in a way revisits and undoes the exclusionary forms of national identity. So, uh, in uh, Sadat Hasan Mantu, we see uh, there is a, a refusal to uh, you know connect the fragments uh, in order to facilitate any form of a reconciled and complete historical memory. So, uh, history is uh, actually torn apart, uh, history is uh, laid asunder and beyond any uh, reconciliation. And so, uh, the question of human forgetting is uh, at, at the surface, it is something that the reader has to confront. Forgetting of history is something that is impossible. Uh, in the way Manto presents his stories. And Gyan Pandey would uh, note that the fragments in literature, diaries and testimonies bear the perspectives uh, of the marginalized groups, they act as a rupture in the self uh, representation of particular uh, totalities. All these uh, mini narratives, micro uh, histories actually uh, disrupt the uh, totalitarian uh, understanding of, uh, of, of uh, violence or human experience. So, uh, Manto's stories undecidability, they are liminal uh, positionings that uh, counter human forgetting uh, are a way of uh, getting back uh, at the ethical closure of the horrors of partition, the gory uh, events or chapters of partition in favor of celebratory narratives. So, Manto's undecidability or liminality uh, undoes uh, the celebratory narratives. He questions the very possibility of any narrative in the face of the animosities and atrocities that were witnessed uh, uh, before and after the partition. So, with this I am going to stop today's lecture and let us meet again uh, for uh, another round of discussions in the following lecture. Thank you.